So, and thank you all 460 who are still uh, watching this for uh, sticking it out for the last few hours. I've really enjoyed uh, the prior speakers. Um, so <clears throat> Al Rotan, as, as we've all expressed, uh, was a true giant and a mentor to all of us. But besides um, being a master of surgical anatomy, a um, uh, really creative surgeon himself, uh, a uh, superb educator, and a builder of one of the best departments of neurosurgery in the country, he was also an inventor. When I spent a year as a fellow with Charlie Drake, uh, I discovered um, Charlie always asking for what he called uh, my little thing. And that was a row time number six. And I asked him, why do you use that? He says, because it's a great dissector and the size of the tip is exactly the size of a Sagita aneurysm clip that I can um, fit uh, into small spaces. And as the residents and fellows here at Stanford know, this is my favorite dissecting uh, instrument as well. Here are my disclosures. When I trained, of course, um, we didn't operate in the brainstem, thalamus, or basal ganglia because it was too high-priced real estate. Uh, but over the years, uh, we do now operate there, and I'll show you some of the uh, examples of that. Um, and it's because of advances in our understanding the anatomy and the physiology, as well as advances in computer technology, navigation, uh, anesthesia techniques, um, and instrumentation that we can uh, operate safely here. We tried treating brainstem um, and deep cavernous malformations with radiosurgery in the late 1980s and early 90s, and it doesn't work. And so in 1990, I started operating on uh, cavernous malformations in these deep locations, and I've operated on 316 patients. And um, as we learn more about skull-based approaches, we've applied these um, in various ways to operating in the brainstem uh, and thalamus. Here was one of the first um, uh, patients I treated, uh, one of the, uh, and the youngest. You can see he bled into his uh, medulla and lower pons um, from this cavernous malformation. And there are safe places to enter the brainstem. We've learned this is the lateral medullary zone, which is how I entered this. This is uh, on the left side, a far lateral approach. Uh, the feet are down here, the head's up here. And here are the lower cranial nerves. I'm pulling the vertebral artery medially and stimulating the side of the medulla. This is the safe zone. Make a small incision. And there's the clot you'll see being expressed. And then fairly straightforward manner, able to get out the small cavernous malformation. And um, what surprises me even now is the way the brainstem can reconstitute itself after resecting uh, these malformations and taking out a clot. And he was one of the uh, uh, minority of patients who actually improved immediately, probably by removing the clot as well as the malformation. You can see his hemiparesis resolved immediately, although he still has a six nerve palsy. This was the first patient that I attempted to resect a malformation after he had three clinical hemorrhages where the malformation did not present to the uh, peel or ependymal surface. And the way I approached this was a subtemporal approach with a transtorial extension that allows me to reach the upper pons. And I'll show you another case where I actually did a petrosectomy in order to reach uh, more anteriorly in the pons. Navigation is critical. This is how I approached it. Um, this is the right subtemporal approach, the carotid arteries uh, anteriorly here. And what I'm doing is to retracting the tentorium. I cut the tent. Here's the fourth nerve, the fifth nerve, the superior cerebellar artery. After stimulating the side of the pons, made a small incision. Here's the hemosiderin stain brainstem, taking out the malformation and was able to do this through a three or four millimeter opening. Uh, we did lose his motor evoke potentials and he woke up hemiplegic. Uh, I was quite worried, although within 12 hours he was moving the left side quite well. And you have to understand, you will set patients back temporarily. However, within a week, he only had mild left ankle weakness. So within four months, he was neurologically normal and shooting his single digit handicap in golf again. Um, 
Now this one uh, malformation uh, in a patient who had bled three times over four years is located more anteriorly. And here, what you need to do is a petricectomy. So drilling the petrous bone extradurally, opening very anteriorly. Now we're working actually anterior to the fifth nerve. And again, making a small incision in the hemosiderin stained pons and then taking out the malformation. And she did quite well. For these anterior uh, midbrain lesions, uh, I find um, them quite challenging. And what I've been doing is to actually approach it contralaterally instead of ipsilaterally um, with retraction of the uh, ipsilateral uh, peduncle. So come in from the contralateral side that gives you the best angle. And the key here is to be very uh, cautious working around the basilar artery and all the perforators. And you can see here, this is on the right side to take out the left-sided lesion. Um, here's the basilar artery exposed, uh, the malformation, and taking out the malformation worked very nicely for this patient. Uh, what about the thalamus um, and upper midbrain? Um, for these lesions, um, I like to approach it uh, if it doesn't come to the surface to the pulvinar. I've never seen a deficit operating there. And the key to this uh, are the veins, of course. And uh, you must be very, very uh, meticulous in preserving the deep venous system. So for this case, I came um, to the uh, paramedian um, with the patient prone. So um, the feet are down here, the head's up here. This is the, tent, uh, this is the Fox tentoriums here. And um, incising the inferior Fox and the tentorial edge, here's the pulvinar. And again, using navigation uh, to go directly to the malformation and take it out. We worsened his diplopia slightly, uh, but however that recovered. What I think is a major innovation is uh, what I've been doing uh, for the uh, for the past um, uh, decade or more, or a little more, and that's using a CO2 laser, which has a, a diameter of 0 0.5 millimeters. And um, I've used this in 231 cases, mostly CAVMELs, uh, since 2009. And um, I'll show you how this works. I think this is absolutely the gentlest way to take out these deep uh, vascular malformations or those in um, critical areas. Here's a dorsal um, uh, midbrain lesion. And using a far lateral infratentorial supracerebellar approach, you can see the laser, 0 0.5 millimeter, make a small incision. And these are, this is nice because you can use it as a dissecting instrument. It also uh, seals and severs the small vessels it does not interfere with um, electrophysiological monitoring, unlike the bipolar, and um, uh, it does not require tugging of tissue. Another case I used this on, um, difficult lesion again in the anterior uh, midbrain and hypothalamic region. Um, and the way I approached this was actually through the lamina terminalis. It was the first time I've done this approach. Here you can see we're on the left side, the lesions on the right, so contralateral, optic nerve. Here's the carotid artery. We came over here um, in the lamina terminalis. Now we're working in front of the optic chiasm, opening the lamina terminalis. And there's the malformation with just a small rim of tissue have to be careful of the mammillary bodies and the fornices here. I don't think I could have resected this using even the smallest bipolars because of the small working space, but the laser worked beautifully to resect this malformation through the lamina terminalis. And she did well within six months, uh, she was back to normal actually, uh, uh, back to work. And what we found um, pathologically uh, is that uh, as opposed to the bipolar where there's significant thermal injury, there's minimal injury using the laser uh, at very low wattage of five watts. Um, so I talked about the advantages. Uh, the main disadvantage are hemostasis for larger vessels where you still need to use a bipolar and you cannot operate around corners since it's a, uh, a fixed 
um, non-malleable laser. And you can see, if you look at the immediate results uh, post-op, uh, a third of the patients are worse. However, if you look at six months, and you have to explain this to the patients and families, 90% of the patients are the same or better. Um, I want to talk about another innovation that we've been pioneering at Stanford, and that is um, neurosurgical simulation using 3D virtual reality. Very useful for preoperative planning, intraoperative um, uh, navigation and use, uh, patient engagement, and especially education. We've done about 1,500 cases since 2016 at Stanford. Um, here's an example of a giant aneurysm uh, that came in. It was a ruptured aneurysm in a young man. And you can see the anatomy with the conventional 3D reconstruction. Difficult to see exactly what's going on. But look at this. You can actually rehearse the surgery ahead of time. You can see the detailed anatomy. And you can see the M1 going into the aneurysm. You can delineate the two branches and two branches coming out of the aneurysm. You can even make a 3D model, a print of this. And this helped me to decide to actually do a bypass and trap the aneurysm, which are more nicely for this patient. Another patient with polycystic kidney disease and a complex middle cerebral artery aneurysm. We couldn't even do an aneurysm, uh, an angiogram because of uh, her renal uh, failure. And so again, look at the beautiful anatomy. We weren't sure based on the conventional imaging if this vessel was coming out of the aneurysm, but this 3D reconstruction on surgical theater is the system we're using, showed that it was likely a, a vessel that was adherent to the aneurysm dome and not arising from it. And that's exactly what it looked like at surgery. Here's the middle cerebral artery. Here's the vessel I had to dissect off of the aneurysm. And then once that's dissected off, uh, again, a fairly straightforward manner to simply clip the aneurysm and reconstruct the bifurcation, preserving all of the vessels, confirm with Doppler, and then with an intraoperative ICG angiogram. And she did well, went on to get her uh, kidney transplant. For AVMs also, this 3D virtual anatomy has been uh, uh, really a quantum leap in understanding the anatomy of the AVM with respect to the brain, but also being to overlay the uh, fiber tracts, the cortical spinal tract and the sensory tract, as well as the visual fibers to help select what the best approach to minimize injury is. Uh, very, very useful uh, in terms of approaching uh, brainstem cavernous malformations and other deep lesions. And we can now even overlay functional MR data uh, onto the uh, 3D imaging, um, which uh, again, very, very helpful in, in terms of, um, of uh, operating on these patients. Um, I want to show you how we use augmented reality. This patient had a subarachnoid hemorrhage from this complex middle cerebral aneurysm, was partially coiled elsewhere and then transferred to Stanford with residual aneurysm. And here I'm um, dissecting the aneurysm. It's a mess because of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And here's the middle cerebral artery, the distal M1. And I had a hard time knowing where the temporal M2 branch was because of the blood and the aneurysm dome. And here we can overlay the image preoperatively to find the uh, temporal branch and avoid rupture of the aneurysm. So very, very nice way. And here you can see the coils to um, use this augmented reality and help define the anatomy, which is obscured by clot and subarachnoid hemorrhage with a nice postoperative result. I'll show you another example. This was a, uh, uh, sorry, this was a, um, a very complex um, paraclinoid aneurysm that Art Day um, described so well. And you can see, um, I'm gonna show you the 3D uh, rendition of this. What we're able to do is actually uh, rehearse the surgery through a craniotomy. And then we can see the three-dimensional details of this aneurysm. 
with respect to the clinoid. And then furthermore, at surgery, I'll show you how we use the augmented reality. So here I'm drilling the clinoid. And um, so the clinoid's off, here's the aneurysm, but now I overlay the augmented reality to see exactly where the aneurysm to see if I have enough exposure after opening the dural ring using a fenestrated clip, right angle clip. And then ICG nicely shows its patent. There's the aneurysm dome, which has been clipped. And then again, the augmented reality confirms that I've got the whole aneurysm clipped and you can see um, that true here. Here's the clip with a nice result. These giant aneurysms, I think, are still uh, very, very challenging. Um, even with endovascular therapy, here's a patient I treated recently with a uh, two uh, giant tandem left vertebral artery aneurysms uh, arising from the left vertebral artery. The more proximal aneurysm is mostly thrombose uh, with a channel through it that fills the distal giant aneurysm here. And there's also some inflow you can see from the contralateral vertebral artery retrograde through the ipsilateral vert into the aneurysm. So we coiled this giant aneurysm and occluded the left vertebral artery. Patient did well for a year and a half and then progressed with progressive brainstem uh, compression signs. You can see there's still a jet of blood from the contralateral uh, injection uh, retrograde uh, through the distal vert on the ipsilateral side. And here's the Ica pica uh, on the left draped over the aneurysm. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, fiber tracts, cortical spinal and sensory tracts are uh, uh, distorted and um, compressed to the contralateral side. So what I did here was to use a left retromastoid approach, retract the cerebellum. Here's the lower cranial nerves. Here's the 12th nerve. Here's the lower aneurysm, which was largely thrombose, but causing mass effect. I couldn't cut into it, so I had to drill off the calcified rim carefully and then use a CUSA or Sonopet to remove uh, the clot and decompress the brainstem. The distal aneurysm was still patent even though it had coils in it. Open it up, there's still some bleeding retrograde from the, uh, the other vert. And you have to be careful with these coils, they're very sharp. Cut the coils, remove clot. And here you can see actually the distal uh, vertebral artery coming out of the aneurysm with a perforator. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, let me. Show you. Okay, so now I have trapped the aneurysm, you can see. And then I went on to uh, clip the remaining aneurysm actually um, to, seal, uh, to seal the final um, dome. Uh, this patient um, uh, had mild worsening of his symptoms, but within nine months, um, most of his symptoms had resolved completely. We've now clipped 95 aneurysms after coily stenting or flow diverter. And I still think that these giant aneurysms uh, will have to be treated through a combination of techniques that are gonna require surgery. I just wanna end by talking about something uh, that is completely different, but I think an innovation that we are going to be applying within the next decade, and that is a strategy to recover function after stroke uh, for which we have no treatment now. And one of those is cell transplantation. Um, we started this 20 years ago in my lab, transplanting human fetal neural, neuronal stem cells into the rat brain and showed you can recover function. And of course, the original notion was that these neural stem cells transplanted become uh, cells in the brain and then differentiate and reconstitute circuits, but that's not true. What they do is to secrete very powerful trophic and growth factors that enhance native mechanisms of recovery, including axonal dendritic sprouting and geogenesis. They have a very powerful effect on neuromodulation, on immunomodulation. So in a simple sense, what they do is uh, turn the adult brain into a neonatal or infant brain, which recovers very well after uh, insults like strokes. We worked with a local stem cell country, uh, company and did the first intracerebral stem cell trial in North America, taking uh, donor cells from two donors that were expanded in culture, 
cryopreserved and shipped to uh, the sites. And we treated 18 patients who were between 33 and 75 years old. Um, and between uh, seven months and three years after their stroke, you knew they weren't going to recover. Um, we looked at efficacy and um, safety, and this is what the strokes looked like. They had to have a subcortical stroke, which is what we targeted, but many had a cortical stroke as well. Um, we did it under local anesthesia using a stereotactic frame and a burr hole the size of about a nickel. And we treated 18 patients. I treated 12 at Stanford, six at University of Pittsburgh were treated and we did a dose escalation. And not only did we find they were safe, but to our um, surprise, we found that the patients recovered their function starting within a month, increased to three months. We had a statistically significant improvement in their baseline uh, chronic deficits at six months. This was compared to their baseline uh, motor dysfunction. And this was true on several uh, of the scales. I'll show you a patient. This patient is two years out from a stroke. She's paralyzed on the left side, cannot move her arm or leg except for her thumb. This is a neurologist, Neil Schwartz, examining her. Can't get her leg off the bed. She's in wheelchair for two years. And we transplanted her and um, went by the next day to see what, what she was like. Um, and here she is one day later. Do you know? Oh my goodness. Video you see that? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So this really surprised us. In fact, um, Neil Schwartz, the neurologist, sent me this. I must admit it's a bit of a miracle when a neurologist says that uh, you know it's not a placebo effect. We tried to figure out what was uh, 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 responsible for the uh, restoration of function, and there's no change in the fiber tracts, but we noticed um, one week later, a new, D, uh, a new flare lesion, DWI negative, so it's not a stroke in the premotor cortex. It goes away by two months, never reappears, but she's better even a year later. That's and now she's two. walking. That's three. Okay. A second patient, a younger one who had a stroke two years out, she up. cannot move her arm. She could barely talk. You couldn't understand her and she could not walk well. She did not want to get married because she felt she'd be embarrassed walking down the aisle. Here she is two and a half months after her transplant. And then here she is four and a half years later and she's still this good seven years later. She actually gave me an award at the Smithsonian Institute. So look at her scan. This is pre-transplant. This is a higher level. One day later, the higher level looks the same except for a little blood in the sulcus. At one week, you can see she's got that flare lesion in the premotor cortex. It, it resolves again by two months, never reappears. And 14 of the 18 patients had this new flare lesion. That lesion, which is only transient, is significantly correlated, the size of that, with the recovery at 12 months and 24 months. So what do we learn? Not only is this safe and feasible, but we learned something we didn't know. It's changed our notion of what happens after a stroke. Those circuits are not dead or irreversibly damaged like we thought. They're probably idling and we can resurrect them. We're just figuring out how. The company and, and um, I've been involved in doing a chronic TBI multicenter study with the same cells, which was positive. Um, we did a uh, further study with um, stroke patients, which was unfortunately negative at the primary outcome, but subgroups were positive. So we're looking at which groups improve. 
We still don't know what the best cells are. A lot of unanswered questions. When should we treat the patient? Should we immunosuppress? We didn't immunosuppress in that trial. How should we deliver the cells? I think intracerebral into the brain is going to be best. And that's what we as cerebral vascular surgeons are going to be doing. So I think that this is a therapy that's going to hold great promise. We still need to answer fundamental issues. Um, and we need to do further phase one, two, and three trials with controls. So with that, I want to thank you all uh, so very much for your attention. Uh, again, I've really enjoyed the symposium, and I hope you'll enjoy um, the remaining days of it. Thanks a lot.